There we go. Great, Jaime. Lovely to have another chance to talk um, in this series. So for anybody who's interested in who you are and our 25 year uh, history of working together, um, I'll put the link to our first conversation um, in the subtext of, of this one. But um, we haven't had enough time to kind of catch up over the last year, year and a half. And a lot has happened since we last talked where you've finished your PhD and you've written a book. And uh, I would just love to hear more about your book like that that came out of your PhD. Um, what is it about? Um, tell us. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle, for this invitation for renewed conversation. Well, this conversation of my book, What If Women Design the City, is very much at the intersection of two mega trends informing the world we live in, mm -hmm. which is the rapid urbanization of human population and repositioning of women in society. When we talk about mega trends, we're talking about trends that are unfolding within 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, very slowly, gradually, but steadily. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, for instance, cities, we have already crossed the threshold. There are more people living in cities than rural areas. The projection by uh, UN Habitat is by 2050, which is around the corner. We're going to be 70% of humanity living in cities. When you think about cities cover 4% of the surface of the planet, only 70% percent of humanity living in 40 in four percent of the surface and you know emitting over 85 percent of carbon emissions and and depleting natural resources 75 percent so cities are really important in the conversation of redesigning of human presence in the planet and then you have repositioning women in society and and um, at the UN you have two two different roles at the international community. You have the agenda holders and you have the knowledge brokers. So reposition of women in society, for instance, is, is the agenda is UN women, you know, rapid urbanization of human populations, UN habitat. However, knowledge brokers such as World Bank, OECD, EU, uh, EU backed, they have published over the last five, seven years, a series of reports um, reinforcing the fact that historically cities have been designed and built and developed by using the male experience as a reference. Therefore, cities work better for men than they work for women, girls, other levels of ableness age and gender identities. So these are not the agenda holders. These are the knowledge brokers realizing that there's something wrong in the way we have been designing the city. And uh, so at the same time, there's a growing interest right now in what I say, I call it a mosaic of urban interventions developed by cities like Vienna that has 30 years of gender sensitive urban planning, Ume in Sweden, Barcelona, people are interested how is to design in a more inclusive way? So my book, my my research comes from this, this dialogue. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you are the one who introduced me to Triarchy Press that I'm grateful. You know, when uh, uh, Andrew realized that I was using um, a systems thinking framework to put together, we can talk more about how I raised the, the information, the findings, but I was organizing using Donella Meadows uh, leverage points framework, um, which is a systems thinking framework. So he he offered me a contract and uh, thanks it, for introducing it, me to Andrew. It fits very well in, in, in Triarchy. And um, yes, I mean, the, the methodology of how you did your PhD research and, and um, got to the findings that you then made much more digestible than a PhD thesis. Um, uh -huh. In your book is also really interesting. I I, I just love this idea that you went for walks in in cities with women. Um, could yeah. you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. So basically, the whole principle is not using an old map to explore a new territory. So if you are going to explore what if women designed a city, I didn't want to sit with a with women or um, or even walk with women. 
and start uh, walking with them and looking what is wrong here and who is responsible for doing that. I didn't want women to come up with a list of things that needed to be done, um, you know, implemented by the council or by the local government so that they could feel seen. And uh, so uh, I created this regenerative framework of inquiry where I decided to, the first question I would take from, uh, I would pose to the women was like, what is unique about your neighborhood? So you start with looking at uniqueness of it. From the uniqueness, you then go, okay, so what is then the potential in the, within this uniqueness? And by walking their territory, you give much more space for, first is, is multi-sensory. And you also give space for setting deputy, for things to happen that you inspect. And you can also expose your mental ideas in open air and have many more ideas. So it was very rich and women were, completing charge of the research process. They'll tell me where they wanted to meet and I'll meet them there. And of course I, I develop a whole, uh, an app, a spatial app and I had a state of the art tablet. So I had spatial data, I had audio data and visual data because I also take photographs. It took me some time. I did lots of practicing before I start the walk interviews. Um, but women were in charge because it should start when it starts, it ends when it ends. They would mm -hmm. take me wherever they wanted to take me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very, very enriching, including for them, because then you start working with what is unique. So you don't, you don't start looking at the problem. You start looking at, you know, the, the glass, how full. And from there, and you know that, you know, potential resides in the uniqueness of place, into the biocultural spatial uniqueness of place. So then I say, what is the potential here? And then, of course, you're not naive to say, well, there's only potential and every potential can be realized. You have to work with the, the three lines of force. So you have the, the potential and you have the restraints coming. Then I would invite, so what are the restraining forces that can come in and help to mold the potential and reconcile in new, new lines of work? So we work with the restraints. So everything walking, potential, restraints. So what can be reconciled here? So new lines of work. And then I would go and start by then people are not already have already gone beyond problem solving and the problem was in the hands of the municipality. There was already been much widened uh, conversation. And then from there you start uh, start inviting them to start looking at identifying a network of responsibilities. So who would be responsible for implementing this new line of work? And then finally, what is your role? What is the role of women? So you position yourself. So it was an emancipatory journey in itself. So as a consequence, I, can, I had- I can yeah. see how um, deeply influenced and guided you were by the frameworks the, uh, works developed by Regenesis Group. Like the, the, the it was like, um, Pamela Mang wrote a very nice foreword for for your book where where um, she said something like um, that she, with that title she wouldn't be expecting a masterclass in regenerative practice and you were just really beautifully talking through the the um, main framework behind re regenesis um, and explaining how the, how that uh, informed your research. Can you say a little bit more about um, your did you have any support from Anybody in Regenesis while you were doing this work, or is it through us doing the TRP together here on, on Mallorca? Um, how did you let yourself be informed by their work? Well, I think it goes much further back. Mm -hmm. Remember that at university, my teacher was Paulo Freire. So I was born, you know, into world work very much with the pedagogy of autonomy. Mm -hmm. I've always been like this, and I practiced this for many years when I became an educator within the eco-village movement. And then I've done a TRP that gave me many more other tools to me. And when I went to do my PhD, Pamela Mank was one of my mentors. She did, we did meet every season of my PhD, and I'll come back to her. I had my two formal supervisors at the university. And then I had Pamela coming back and I'll come. So we met over four seasons. Once a, once every season, I'll come back to her and say, what you, and, and I'll explain. And, and, and she, she, yeah, it was very enriching. And she also wrote one of the, it was interesting because 
the two uh, forwards of my uh, pref uh, of my book. One is by uh, two iconic women in my life. One is uh, Eva Caillou. She's the head of uh, urban planning in Vienna, and she just retired. Uh, she worked for 35 years for the city, and she was the first one bringing gender-sensitive urban planning, really thinking about you know how to make the city enjoyable for not only women and girls, but all ages and, and level, uh, levels of ableness. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, so that was the methodology. So it's like very much not using an old map mm -hmm. to explore a new territory. And in itself, so imagine I had this incredible amount of data, I had spatial data, the photographs, I had the audio. And you, you know, in a PhD, you have to be scientifically robust. So I had to write everything down. And I did, uh, I used uh, uh, Sharma's analysis framework of grounded theory it was very tactic. I had, I had uh, tactile, I had to uh, paint every theme and start making relationship. And then I, I, I look at uh, different waves of a framework from systems thinking. And I taught the leverage points um, from Donella Meadows, which is you make, you know, one intervention in the case in the urban system, a small intervention can, that can have a big impact was mm -hmm. just a proper uh, framework. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually the results, the 33 leverage points are not my ideas at all. They are all coming from the women. Mm -hmm. And a final point in the methodology that this was an applied research. Therefore, I went to the city council and say, I'm interested in doing this. Are you interested in the findings of that? So they they not only um, they said, yes, we are interested. They also uh, helped me to uh, identify or they introduced me to the gatekeepers of the communities. Mm -hmm. And in every city, I wanted to walk with women from affluent areas and hard to reach neighborhoods. I never wanted to come from one segment of society, the ideas. Mm -hmm. So. So, in, for instance, in, in, in Edinburgh, I walk with women from Western Hales, which is a, a modernist uh, scheme uh, that has been uh, retrofitted since the 60s for so many times. And also I walk with women from Portobello, which is like um, a gentrified neighborhood. Um, so and then in a, and then putting this together and reaching the, to the 33 um, leverage points. And now because well, it is... On. Hold on a sec. Um, how many cities did you? Um, three do? cities. Three cities. Okay. Yeah, uh, I was I was going to walk uh, uh, work with um, European cities that had already some track record on gender sensitive urban planning, but because of COVID, and you know you could travel, you could not travel. So walk interviews was just the right thing during the you know at the end of COVID, and I did in three cities in 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 Scotland. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so what? Let's talk about the findings. I'm curious. What um, what were them? Yeah. What well, maybe because they were 33, and I created this, um, ah, you know, yeah. these flashcards, which has a picture in one side mm -hmm. and a description in the back. Maybe we can even play a game here. You can say mm -hmm. a number from one to 33, and I go and get one, and I'll describe oh, that to you. That's, that's nice. <laughs> uh, let's go for 17 then. 17, let's see. Oh, uh, before I do that, I can say that I was actually working with four thematic areas. Mm -hmm. I was working with sense of place, active travel, green spaces, and safety, which were very much, I used the, the gaps between when I crossed SDG 11, which is sustainable cities and communities, and SDG uh, 5, which is uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. And I look at the gaps in data between the two and realize these were the four that were really missing lots of, uh, of data. So I work with these four. Uh, so you're going to see when you say numbers, you're going to see that they will fall into one of the of these categories. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is called designing fresh air routes and low emission zones from the perspectives of women and infants. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Mm -hmm. So here there are many parameters coming together. Um, one of them, let's start looking at infants perspective. There's research that say that 
I think is the University of Surrey suggests that children in prams are exposed to 60 mm -hmm. more uh, road pollution than adults because they are at the level of the exhaust pipes uh, and the pollutants enter directly into their system. So you see, when the, when your mom is well with prams and they're stopping in the streets because, you know, of science, kids are having much more pollutants. And it's, and it's heavy metals and then neurons. And it's, yes, exactly. Yeah. What are we so, doing? And, and, and it's known that, as, um, you know, that the faster the vehicle speed, the greater exhaust emissions are emitted. So uh, some of these areas, particularly the the social housing, the cars really speed and the the zebra crosses, they they because we are car centered um, universe, urban universe, uh, it takes much longer for pedestrians to cross than cars. There's, there's much more time for cars to cross than, than pedestrians. So, and the other thing was, this was about um, some women that I walked that they made sure to to take me to routes that were fresh air routes. They, there were no cars. You know, if women designed the city, I'll say that uh, uh, cars would be invited as guests and uh, uh, much more than it is right now. So the fresh air routes is about creating routes where um, streets are for people much more than cars. And, um, and transforming areas uh, from being dominated by fast moving uh, highways into soulful pathways that um, other infants have the possibility of, you know, really breathing fresh air and the sense of the flowers and all of that. So if women design the city, we were going to be designing streets with fr for fresh air or uh, designing fresh air routes. There was a woman that I walk with in one of the cities that said to me, and, and we were walk, walking the city center, and she took me from the place we met for about 45 minutes, just, you know, uh, looking at little pockets of green over fences and all of that. And she was showing me how you can actually walk a city only by connecting the green spaces and avoiding cars. So and, that's the the. Um, and in the, the in the pattern of your work, so you, so you would then find that suggestion. But did you then also go in terms of the leverage points? What would be like the next steps to actually implement that? Yes, so mm -hmm. some some of them, for instance, there is one here, let me just see, there was one leverage point that was saying was a realization of some women uh, that women cyclists, so women cycle much less than men, particularly for commuting in UK. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when you start when you start looking at what is the potential of women start cycling more, that's about active travel. And uh, so many women were talking about how saddles are uncomfortable for their bodies. Mm -hmm. So here, a leverage point, which is devising a library of women tailored bike saddles with women, like when you have a baby and you, and you have a baby, you go to a shop and you 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 you, you look at those carriers and you and you try the carriers that is better for your body and for your baby and, and the same with with bike saddles you're going to every shop or a, to a community and you have different bike saddles and you can, can try what you are because we have a completely different type of body and bones uh and and and, and, and bicycles have been much more designed for men's body than women's body so uh, by devising a library of women tailored bike saddles, this will increase the interest of women of cycling leisurely and comfortably. Therefore, this will grow the number of women cycling to commute and for leisure ends. And therefore, you're going to be promoting much more active travel as a way of life. Mm -hmm. So so you see that the library of, you know, the saddles, you mm -hmm. know, the library the interest of women, you know, adopting saddles that would work will increase the the amount of women and therefore cutting carbon emissions. And then you can go on and on and on. Remember, when I said to you, this 4% of the surface of the planet, put all the cities together, mm -hmm. they cover that, that surface. And out of that, 1.8 
to 2% are covered by roads mm. or motorized vehicles. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what modern cities tend to look like. I, I often wonder um, to what extent those predictions are actually like most forecasts have the problem that they are based on trends of the past and data of the past and they don't um, they capable of um, including the emergence in complex systems um, what can happen to change that trajectory between now and even to 2050 um, like this this self-fulfilling prophecy of um like i remember when we were working with seafar uh, fintorn together um people were talking about that threshold of 50 percent because we hadn't crossed it yet yeah and, and it was it felt like okay now that we've been saying it for the last 10 years now it's true mm. um like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to some extent and it's also in in the interest of certain types of development, which is m pushing towards digitalization and um, and a continuation of this pro making people pawns in a big business game of multinationals. Um, mm. that drives a little bit this agenda towards let's have them all in cities. Um, and I, I think that there, there could be or well, there certainly is in terms of the affluent population, there's a the contrary trend now. Like I even just where I live, um, I see a lot of people from big cities uh, arrive on Mallorca looking for a diff different type of life. And um, of course, the privileged ones. Yeah. But what's your th thought on these kind of urbanization agenda predictions? And and also in what would be interesting because you did this research at Dundee and, and Patrick Geddes, taught at Dundee, um, I would be fascinated <clears throat> to find out whether you you had any, in these conversations, did anything come up that was in a Gadesian spirit in the sense of cities have to be planned in the context of their bioregion and they have to be much more localized in their provisioning than our current um, mega cities are. Um, yeah, so there's three layers to your question. The first one is about questioning the the urbanization megatrend. And as I mentioned in the beginning, megatrends, they unfold over decades. So if we are going to have the ruralization of the human population, this needs to start showing up. But right now, it can be showing up, but just in the global north, very, very limited countries. Uh, because the big which really are African continent, Southeast Asia and Latin America, mm -hmm. you know, people are still moving to the cities. They are still moving to the cities. Mm -hmm. um, and for this to take place, to go back to the bioregion and all that needs maybe it can be a quick trend. But if it's a mega trend, may need to go back into that. But uh, it is still the movement, all the numbers, they 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 are you know, saying this is a big a movement in, in, in where the population are the younger population in the planet, because in the global north, we also getting older and much longer. The young population, they're all moving to the cities in African continent and Southeast well, Asia. It's, it's interesting, though, like, uh, because I, I mean, I've worked a lot on, on Foresight in, in UK Foresight and other organizations and um, you also scan the early signs of a trend flipping. And what I've just, just last week, I read that in India, for example, there's a, again, driven by the more wealthy class, the more privileged, people are fleeing the cities and starting permaculture farms in rural areas of India because of the heat island effect. Like because of the, 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 the climate change has like just recently we've had temperatures in the 50s in mm -hmm. Nepal. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, my question here is not about, I mean, it is the conversation of the urban bioregional, it is, but mm -hmm. my conversation is that within the urban, mm -hmm. cities have been designed for a rapid motorized mobility, not mm -hmm. for proximity. 
-hmm. So we're talking about redesigning for urban proximity. Why 20 Minutes Neighborhood was born in Melbourne and Portland, and then Paris adopted the 15 Minute City. Paris is a huge city, but it's a city of villages. And I have worked with the Eco Village movement. I have worked with the Transition Town movement. It's all about identity, sense of place. You may be still work, vi living in a megalopolis, but if you are practicing uh, you know, this uh, urbanism of proximity where you were seen and you recognize where your safety is provided by the eyes of the city, uh, the eyes of the neighbors where you buy locally, where, where we have independent shops and we have schools and health service. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the redesign. We don't need to bring everybody back to the rural area for yeah. having mm -hmm. a redesign of our uh, ecological footprint. And the most amazing that like COVID has taught us so many lessons, like uh, connecting all these pockets of greens that cities still have, mm -hmm. you know, creating corridors for, for wildlife. And one of the key, um, I think one of the key leverage points is the leverage point number one, that was a recurrent pattern in the conversations with women was about the need to uh, develop um, um, uh, a biophilic uh, perspective, love for nature within cities, yeah. within cities. And you can do that by having little pockets of green connected and the whole thing around, you know, children, you know, they make their connections and, and, and uh, you know, all the values you have, all those pedagogues like Steiner, Montessori, Piaget saying that from one to seven years old is when you get all your main uh, values being built or what is going to be important to you. So if you, uh, kids that are born in the cities that don't have opportunity of having a, a, a vast background, but you still can uh, enhance the possibility of connecting with nature in a city. And, um, and then by doing that, um, cultivating biophilia, these kids, when they become teenagers, if you, you cultivate biophilia between one and seven years old in pockets of greens that are connected in your neighborhood and in, and then connects into parks why the parks and and by and also the bioregion everything is connected with the bioregion so if you have this this conversation this experience from one to seven years when these kids become uh, um, adolescents they are not going to trash the park because they had this inherent love for everything that is alive. And when they become a CEO, they are not going to want to control nature because that was already awakened. And uh, so cultivating biophilia is one of the leverage points that the women, um, that can be done in cities and through design, through designing fresh air routes by making sure that uh, uh, increasing the, the number of diversity of trees, installing garden boxes and all those things mm -hmm. Curitiba is doing, m more and more cities are doing, um, integrating rain gardens into streets and all that. So um, here, Maybe. plan, yeah. Well, Go. Briefly, yeah. Because uh -huh. you, earlier you mentioned Melbourne and the um, in 20 minute neighborhood. And it made me think that I know that from, for other professional reasons, you, you, you've been quite close collaborator of Herbert Girardet um, with your music work and, and, and mm -hmm. so on. Um, have you, when you did your research, talked to Her Herbie about all this? Because, I mean, to many, in many ways, his stint in Melbourne um, working on cities probably seeded the 20-minute um, city initiative that then evolved afterwards. Yes, certainly. I was talking to Herbie all the time, and he actually r read my book and wrote um, wrote a testimonial about my book. Um, mm -hmm. It's somewhere here, and he says uh, something that women inspire urban regenerative development is now an urgent necessity. This is an important book that should be essential reading for anybody concerned about the future of the human habitat. He wrote more than that, but that's what is here. Right. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, just for those who are listening, um, Herbert Gira, they also um, worked um, with the World Future Council on their report on um, regenerative cities. 
and wrote a book about regenerative cities quite a few years back, I think in 2015 or something. Mm. Um, and it's I, I always find that his work is, is really instructive also because he he has a kind of Gadesian approach of how do we um, find ways to connect cities with as, as, as dynamic engines of positive development of the regions that they're settled in like how do we avoid driving this rural urban divide that yeah. um, often then leads to disenfranchised populations in rural areas and then we get situations like in america with trump that that demagogues can can use this disenfranchised uh, rurality to whip up divisive political agendas and and right-wing um, agenda. So it's, it's it's fascinating how all of this is 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 linked. Um, yes, certainly. Uh, I wouldn't. I just want to say this dynamic machine. I'll say this dynamic ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, he would say that a city is not a dynamic machine, but is a dynamic ecosystem. Did I say machine? Yeah, you did. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, uh, it doesn't don't, matter. Normally, don't think in mechanistic. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, but it's like a, it I happens. Think, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, what else are you interested to hear? Um, well, I mean, is there any particular one of the thirty-three points that either really surprised you, or that you kind of say, well, I, they're all really important, but. That's the one that that um, is just my favorite one that came out of this research. Well, there are some interesting ones. There's something around, um, for instance, naming things. Um, there was one um, leverage point that suggests shifting from a mentality of maintenance to an attitude of care. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting one because care is everything that we do to maintain, continue, repair our world. And um, and women realize that poor maintenance or poor care in the cities sends very much a, a simple but a, a graphic message that we don't care. Mm -hmm. So um, so why maintenance is about working with already exists there from an operational perspective. Care is much more about improving the systems. Uh, and in a more relational way. So the way that uh, maintenance is done in cities, in UK cities, I put that way, because the budgets are being really, you know, every year they cut. Uh, they do, I mean, in some of the social housings, like if you don't cannot care, you use what they call tarmac strategy. You come and put cement so you don't need to care. And, uh, and, and so maintenance is poorly done. Maintenance and when when is not well done, it sends this message that we don't care. But then there has been a shift of within neighborhoods as well. People start caring for it, and uh, even with the suggestion that we change the name of the departments and municipalities instead of uh, department of maintenance to department of care, and at the same time you capillarize, you democratize care in the hands of all stakeholders is not anymore the responsibility only of the municipality. This is the local business, the, the residents. And, and when you do that, you start caring for the place. And by changing the name, you also change the perspective that maintaining. So when you start caring, you can even start improving the uh, together because responsibility is democratized. Um, and this reminds us Margaret, Margaret Wheatley saying that, Maggie Wheatley saying, there's no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. Mm -hmm. And communities are more and more caring for the environment. So again, it's an urbanism of proximity. It's like, what do I care? What, how can I care for it? Mm -hmm. So that was a shifting from this mentality from, um, of maintenance to an attitude of care was something interesting but most of them they are all interest i wouldn't say there's one more there's Maybe. one that, that i'm interested in that I just remembered um because i thought when when you first told me about doing these walks with women around these three cities um and you you mentioned that it included earlier one of for 
kind of dimensions was safety. Yeah. And, and it 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 became really like maybe also because I'm the father of a daughter now. Um I I notice much more since we had that first conversation about these walks when I'm in spaces that would make a woman feel uncomfortable to have to walk alone in the in the dark, for example, like these, mm. these how many underpasses, overpasses are poorly lit, or how how many kind of mm. corners are created that just could be alarming. Um, yeah, for somebody who's who's alone. Um, yeah, did you find any specifically to that the the, the women's safety? I'd be really interested. What what you found? Yeah. There are many leverage points on that, but before we go into what are the leverage points, it's important to say that there is there's two aspects to this conversation. One is about feeling safe, and the other one being safe, mm -hmm. and and that's the difference. Feeling safe is much more like a, an inner state, mm -hmm. uh, a person uh, where a person perceives herself or himself protected from harm or danger. So that's about feeling safe. It is much more like a subjective uh, uh, experience and can vary from person to person. I can be in the same you know, block and uh, I can feel safe and somebody else cannot feel safe because of my upbringing, how much I know the place. But there's the other one, which is being safe, which is more objective, is factual, is being in a situation or an environment that uh, where actual risks or threats are present, um, or it could be minimized uh, or effectively managed. So, if you you so you have being safe and feeling safe, there are some uh, some leverage points that is about building the confidence of feeling safe. Mm -hmm. That out, you know, and then there is other ones about um, you know managing the risks so that you can move to the being safe and within the being safe there are uh, also two approaches or two leverage points that you know showed up in the conversations one is about um, improving natural surveillance um, through the community and the other one improving natural surveillance through design mm -hmm. so by by the community i mean um, living in neighborhoods that are very active, that you have the eyes on the street that Jane Jacobs would, would say, you know, there's a passersby, you go to a neighbor, you go to a street, you go to a block, and there's lots of people, so you feel safe because there's the eyes on the street. So, the, uh, and um, so you have the presence of the passersby. And then the, the natural surveillance by design which is design-led surveillance based on the assumption that by designing the built environment or signage or lights, you know, uh, you can make um, uh, that place my, more safe, safer, because uh, you maximize visibility and 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 also those who are um, planning to harm, they feel seen and they will minimize the possibility yeah. of doing harm it, so it, 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 it has just reminded me of something that in greece i don't know if you've ever been to greece but there's a is a, is a um custom that they have these blue glass pieces with like they yeah. look like eyeballs like uh, with a little yeah it's blue yeah. and white and light blue yeah dark pupil in the middle and they hang them um Traditionally, in, in places where they want to be sure not to be burgled, or they hang yeah. the mirrors of their car looking backwards to, to be protection. But yeah. I think it's, it's really something psychological. Even having an image of an eye near a door um, actually has a psychological inf sort of effect on people whether they want to go there and do something illegal or not. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, somehow it... Um... Take the, takes away the incentive of wrongdoing. You know, if you have, and if you're designing uh, settlements, you make sure that architects place uh, windows in the front. So people are, if, if yeah, they the think they are seen. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, like Jane Jacobs, like the 
cul-de-sac development that was fashionable back in those days um, where all the houses were the, the kitchens were looking into the circle where yeah. the children could uh, could then play and and their their moms or their dads could be in the kitchen looking out do it while doing the the the, the work they needed uh, doing and that kind of design just simply because we often have in in cities the kitchen is kind of banned into the not so nice view in the interior of the building like into the into the uh -huh. um courtyard uh -huh. and just by putting the kitchens to look out you always have somebody much more likely to be um observing uh -huh. yes uh, for instance when you think about finhorn that both of us contributed to the echo village for many years when they decided to create the youth building, they decided to put the youth building in the center of the community. It was their place. They could do whatever they want. You could even see the building sometimes jumping up and down with music and things. But it was at the center to say you are the center of our awareness. You know, it was not like at the margins, at the edges of the community, although they would like to go to the dunes and things like that. But it's like, yeah. So, um, yeah, so so safety. And then, for instance, in some of the harder to reach neighborhoods, women were talking about building confidence through easy to access self-defense training and seminars on rights of women and domestic violence, because there they say, well, we are never going to change men. Therefore, we need to be strong. We need to build our self-defense skills. Mm -hmm. So there was another perspective uh, that, you know, we need to be uh, able to defend ourselves if it's needed. So mm -hmm. that's another perspective from those who uh, is about the feeling of being safe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there are a series of recommendations around safety. Uh, for young girls, there was something around, you know, creating transitional houses like in cities. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, places where or managed by youth workers or, um, you know, respected adults where uh, girls could come out of, you know, parties and things and, and stop by in these transitional places where they could feel safe. Nobody would be questioning them and say, oh, you have drunk a lot or whatever. It was safe places for them if there was a need. It was a series of recommendations, very interesting ones. If you want to know more, check the book. Yeah. And <laughs> just how, since the book has come out, like, um, what are you doing with it now? Like, you've got the cards and... Yeah. and um, I know you, um, you. You're never very long in one place, so I imagine you some, somehow doing workshops all around the world with with city designers and city leaders. But what what are you doing? Yes, yeah, so I'm actually following the book. The book is taking me to places more than I'm taking the book to places. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I started where it began. So I I came back to Scotland. The book was launched in January. I came back to Scotland and start going back to the three cities as an applied research, going back to the officials, to the to the communities, to the officials. But interesting enough that the Scottish government uh, took notice of my book uh, at the end of last year, and um, the department of or, or I'm going to say the planning department within the Scottish government uh, felt really uh, moved by the the, the outcome. So. They are promoting a series of conversations, national conversations about gender sensitive planning. So I've done a, a, a big, a big uh, conversation with the planners of the 32 councils, the 131 planners. Today, this afternoon, I have a conversation at uh, Parliament. There's a debate, there's a roundtable conversation on the results of my research to MSPs. And then we're going to do technical sessions. This is a national level. And then it will, um, uh, with the intention of uh, having an international event, bringing cities that are already doing uh, incredible um, interventions, um, like Vienna, Umeja, Barcelona, um, Lyon, um, in the fall with of, um, Scotland declare itself a gender sensitive planning country or something like that. So there is this national conversation that I'm inputting together with many other architects, urban planners, 
uh, Glasgow has declared itself two years ago the first UK feminist city. Edinburgh now has declared feminist city as well. There's a whole conversation taking on and taking me to England as well. So in England, I'm talking to also architects, universities. So in, in UK, there's lots happening in UK with the book. And uh, therefore, I decided, you know, how participatory am I into my conversations? And uh, so I decided to do the, the flashcards that are going to different places now. And then my next, uh, of course, Brazil, my home country, uh, the book is being translated there. It's going to be launched uh, the second part of the year. And, um, and I'm going to do a series of activations of the book and the flashcards in Berlin in June. So that's my, that, I, my next few months. And I, I could imagine that you might get invitations from cities to say, wonderful what you discovered in those three Scottish cities, but we would really love you to um, do something similar or, or, or supervise a similar process um, in yeah. different cities. Has, has that already materialized? Because it, Yes, it, yes, like, I had already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so the, the whole thing is like how applicable are those leverage points into other regions? Yeah. So that's the next conversation. But I've been already invited by um, Mexico to go there to have. Uh, so it's like some of the big, big cities type of it. So so I would say that the ancient ones would say first the leap, then the consolidation of the new ground before I start leaping to the world. I decided to consolidate here more in Scotland to see. I didn't know. I didn't know how many women and men, professionals, architects, uh, urban planners would be um, interested in thinking that the results were uh, relevant and applicable. And right now I'm testing. And uh, so far there has been a great interest in people wanting to more. They want to... Uh, yeah, they buy the book, they wanting the flashcards, and and I'm facilitating conversations. Wonderful. Yeah. No, it's such it's it's also beautiful because you really weave together in this um like your whole story of, of like having been quite active in the feminist movement in, in Brazil, um and and then having learned so much about community and living together in the eco-village movement and, and enabled so many other people to learn more about it through the work of guy education and, and all that. Um, and now bringing this kind of habitat pattern to the big issue of, of cities, like because we, we both shared the common need to take the eco-village message into a more mainstream um, conversation um, and yeah, it's 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 beautiful. I'm I'm celebrating your your book and I'm celebrating your work and it's fascinating. Thanks for the time to talk about it and I'm I'm sure this is going to go a long way and and make an, an impact that is significant and important. So wonderful. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you for being a companion of so many chapters and also for enabling me to uh, by introducing Triarchy uh, for me to turn my ideas of PhD, you know what it means a big PhD, into turning into something that people can read and actually apply. Just, I mean, it's, it's funny to remember how when I came to Findhorn and you were running one of the first eco-village trainings, even before the the GETS, uh, the, the EDE was designed, 2000, 2000 um, the year 2000, um, there was this Afterwards, I went and did my PhD at Dundee, and then I came back to Fintown, and we did the first uh, eco-village training together in Fintown. And then I was sort of this academic that came into this practitioner space. And it's just so lovely to see over such a period how now you've become an academic um, or a pracademic. And yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's it's been a real lovely journey together. Um, and looking forward to the next chapters and the next 30 years of it that's we still have a lot to do <laughs> a lot ahead of us okay have a thank you thank you for your time and um it'll take a while to put this up but um i'll, I'll send you the link when i've posted it bye-bye bye-bye thank you daniel